Looks like Dr. Iyengar's slides are on, so we should be joining shortly. Okay, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. Yes. Hello, Dr. Iyengar. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good, we have uh, quite a few people on the line. And so if you're ready to get started, um, we are ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get started. I thank you all for being here. First of all, I know you're probably tired of Zoom meetings like we all are, but uh, it's probably our best way to keep doing some outreach and um, keep spreading our message here. So um, today we're, we're gonna talk about shoulder pain and in particular talk about some of the approaches to diagnostics, um, trying to get the diagnosis right, I think is a big thing. And then uh, talk about a couple of different common sources of shoulder pain. And then where we go from there uh, will be treatment alternatives. And some of the stuff that we'll discuss today is gonna be um, building on, on the program that we have at St. Joe's that we have, have uh, really come to be a center of excellence for shoulder surgery. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that and then open it up for questions. Uh, one of the challenges I think of, of shoulder pain is getting through a large volume of topics in a short amount of time, but um, we'll hit the high points and then uh, try to take as many questions as we can. So just a quick uh, introduction. So I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I work at Alpine Orthopedic Medical Group. Um, I'm also the founder of a, a, the Stockton Shoulder Institute, which is a subgroup of Alpine Orthopedics. And it encompasses our clinical care and some research work we do as well. We've had a strong partnership with St. Joseph's Medical Center for several years now, um, really becoming a center of excellence in the last uh, two years for shoulder surgery. So my background really briefly, um, I did my medical school and residency at, at UCSF. Um, and then I did a one-year uh, shoulder surgery fellowship at Columbia University in New York uh, that was focused on both minimally invasive arthroscopic shoulder surgery, as well as uh, open shoulder replacement surgery. So I uh, covered the gamut there. And I've been in practice at Alpine Orthopedics since 2013. So I'm in my eighth year now here. And uh, Central Valley has been a great place to practice. Um, like I kind of alluded to before, um, the challenge is always that the shoulder joint is complicated. Uh, that's why I love it. Um, that's why I find it interesting. But it also requires uh, what I call a pretty careful diagnostic approach to try to figure out where the problem is and um, how to properly um, address it. And a couple of things you'll, you'll see, the shoulder has bone structures. Um, it also has um, a muscle structure called a rotator cuff. Uh, that's a kind of a simplified picture of it, but we try to keep things a little bit more simple. Um, it has cartilage. Cartilage is the surface of the ball of the shoulder that forms a, a cartilage cushion, really, that allows you to move it smoothly. And then there's also uh, things around it, like the, the clavicle in the front here, as well as the shoulder blade, they can cause fractures. So there's really a lot of uh, moving parts, uh, no pun intended, but also a lot of things that can potentially go wrong. And so it's always, um, it's always a fun ride for diagnosis. So let's talk about um, what I'll call the big five uh, diagnoses, and then we'll get into some, um, um, we'll call it facts and myths about shoulder surgery here. Sorry, I just got offline here. Any case, so the big five shoulder conditions that we'll talk about here, um, these are the most common things that, that I see in my office on a daily basis. Um, one is uh, shoulder bursitis, uh, also called impingement, we'll cover that. Rotator cuff tears are a big one. Well, we'll cover um, that topic in, you know, in some detail. Biceps tendonitis is a big one. Um, that's also called thrower's shoulder, something very common in athletes or weekend warriors. Um, we'll talk about arthritis. Arthritis is one of the more, um, uh, common diagnoses and probably the one that's um, most exciting in terms of treatments available right now. Uh, we'll talk about frozen shoulder or also known as adhesive capsulitis. That's uh, a big one, particularly in diabetics. And then there's a lot of other weird stuff and we won't go too far into the weeds on some of the more rare diagnoses. But you know, if there's any questions related to this, I'd be more than happy to cover it in the question and answer. So let's talk about bursitis. So bursitis refers to an inflammation of the space around the rotator cuff. 
And it's also referred to as impingement. Impingement refers to a process by which the rotator cuff inflammation actually causes swelling of the lining of the rotator cuff. And as you lift your arm up, that can actually cause a painful sensation that uh, compresses the swollen bursa or the swollen rotator cuff against the uh, shoulder blade. So you'll hear this called, called differently um, shoulder bursitis or shoulder impingement. It refers to kind of the same underlying process. Uh, and that's a common one. You can also get tears of the rotator cuff. Rotator cuff tears, um, that's actually typically referring to tearing or separation of the actual tendon insertion of the muscle from the bone. And rotator cuff tears are, again, probably the most common diagnosis that I see in my practice on a day-to-day -day basis that requires surgery. And a couple of reasons for that. One is um, the rotator cuff itself is obviously subjected to a lot of repetitive stress. As human beings, we do a lot of activities over our shoulder just in our daily life. Um, that can be as simple as you know shampooing your hair. That can be putting on a seatbelt. That can be putting dishes away in a cupboard. And anything that you do in the shoulder typically is going to activate and require this muscle, the rotator cuff, to be fully functional. And because of the wear and tear, it's very common for us to get damage as we age. And the most common age for rotator cuff tears is going to be in your 50s and 60s as that damage accumulates. Now, rotator cuff tears, unfortunately, don't tend to heal very well. And the problem with it, um, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, issue, but one of the main problems is that the rotator cuff muscle and tendon does not have a great blood supply. And so when you start to develop tears in the rotator cuff, um, it can be a little bit difficult to get those to heal. So that's why it's oftentimes a challenge to um, get an MRI scan, figure out what the, the, the diagnosis is, and try to figure out how best to help you heal. And if it's not going to heal, actually, you know, consider the option of surgery. Another common one is biceps tendonitis. Now, you don't see the biceps tendon in this picture, but coming right along this little groove, this little uh, valley in the front of the shoulder is a tendon of the bicep. And People oftentimes think of the biceps as the muscle, which it is, in the, the, the bottom part of the arm. But keep in mind that the, the tendon of the biceps, how it attaches, actually comes up to the muscle and attaches right under the rotator cuff into the shoulder joint. And so a lot of people, when they get shoulder pain in the front of their shoulder, they're not thinking biceps, but it oftentimes is related to the biceps tendon. And this is something that you can diagnose on a careful physical exam. It's a really common condition. Um, the other thing that we see a lot of, um, again, particularly in diabetics, is something called frozen shoulder. So frozen shoulder also is a, a, a relatively common thing that we see. And what it refers to is inflammation and thickening of the capsule of the shoulder. Now, again, you don't see in this image that there's a thin, loose capsule that surrounds the ball of the shoulder. Uh, the normal shoulder capsules are very loose and a very, um, elastic structure, it stretches well in order to allow you to move through a full range of motion. Now, when you get a frozen shoulder, what that means is that loose, stretchy capsule is now turning into scar tissue. And when that scar tissue gets thick enough, it actually restricts the ability for the shoulder to move. And so um, that's commonly referred to as a frozen shoulder. Uh, the medical term for that is adhesive capsulitis, but um, it's something that is very painful and it can cause a, a very tremendous rapid onset of stiffness in the shoulder. And for a long time, this was a, a condition that was extremely frustrating for both patients and for surgeons because there weren't any great solutions to this. But you know, in the last three or four years, um, we've done some research on this condition. Um, we've actually developed some protocols now that actually can help this um, get better more rapidly. And now that's usually the goal. The goal is to get, get this resolved within uh, you know, two to three months rather than traditionally take up to a year. Now, the good news is that most of the time a frozen shoulder can be resolved without surgery. And so that's the big thing that you know, we wanna uh, educate people and, doctor, and other primary care doctors on is that uh, if you get the diagnosis right on a frozen shoulder, you can oftentimes um, get through uh, some physical therapy, get, get some shots and, and get to a better place without having to resort to surgery. So that's a big one. And the last one uh, we'll talk about a little bit is shoulder arthritis. Uh, again, this is the one that probably most exciting in terms of having a lot more options now than there were in the past. Um, shoulder arthritis uh, historically was just, they, they call it the dead arm where you, you couldn't move your shoulder or it was painful and you couldn't do a whole lot about it. But 
now, you know, shoulder replacement surgery is, is really a very common procedure. It's the second most common operation I do in my practice behind rotator cuff. And the outcomes are, are reliably quite good. And so this is something that we try to spread the, spread the word that, you know, there are options for shoulder arthritis. So um, I've said this twice now, and I'll keep coming back to the same point because it is an important point. Um, careful diagnosis in the shoulder is really important. You're, you will almost always get x-rays in your first visit because uh, when you've seen an orthopedic surgeon and that is really important because there's some diagnoses that are still best made on an x-ray um, better than an MRI or CT. So um, get the x-rays, even though you don't think it's a fracture, it's really important. And then the big one in shoulder surgery or, or the shoulder field in general is clinical examination. Um, it really is a physical exam that oftentimes leads you to the diagnosis. And um, as specialists, we actually still rely on our exam more than anything, even uh, more so than MRIs and imaging. So clinical exam is key. And then, yes, in, in 2020, you know, we're going to be very liberal about using MRI scans when necessary. But keep in mind, that comes after the x-rays and after the clinical exam. And, you know, the point that I always make is that you can usually start with conservative management. Conservative um, not is not a political term here. It just means non-surgical. So uh, non-surgical management is our mainstay. But it does depend on the diagnosis. I think it's an important point that there are certain things in the shoulder, for example, a full thickness rotator cuff tear or an unstable joint that really is not going to get better without surgery. And so in that situation, trying to uh, try non-surgical treatment may just be a waste of time. So I think it's important to really discuss this with your specialist. And that, that's a lot of what we will discuss and focus on in the office is trying to figure out. Um, is this something that's going to get better without an operation or, you know, do we need to be a little more uh, realistic about this? So um, that's a discussion that, that um, we really encourage patients to be a part of. And when I say conservative treatment, like I said, traditionally, that's going to be, you know, your cortisone shots. Uh, that's a, an injection to the shoulder to help to relieve pain and inflammation. Uh, that's going to be your uh, anti-inflammatory medications. And that can be a variety of different um, things, including, you know, Motrin, Aleve and things of that nature. And then physical therapy can be very helpful to alleviate a pain and really help with weakness as well. If you feel like your shoulder joint has gotten weak as a result of your condition, um, there are some newer techniques out there. Um, PRP injections are a big thing that we're doing now. Um, that's platelet rich plasma. And without getting into the weeds on the details, what that means in, in a nutshell is basically using your blood, uh, your blood spun down to concentrate platelets to inject that back into the shoulder. Um, in order to help things heal. I mentioned earlier that rotator cuff repair or rotator cuff tears oftentimes have a difficult time healing and that's due to lack of blood supply. So sometimes with PRP injections, you can actually give some um, blood healing factors into the rotator cuff that weren't uh, normally there in very high concentrations. And, you know, it's been a, a very successful way of treating things like partial tears. Um, and full disclosure, you know, I had a, a partial tear in my rotator cuff it wasn't something that needed surgery, but I had a PRP injection that had a very good result from that. So um, it's something that, you know, we really um, um, emphasize now as part of the part of the buffet of options, is what I say. Um, another thing is uh, ultrasound guided injection. So um, whether you're talking about PRP or cortisone shots, oftentimes uh, I'm using ultrasound guidance, which is image guidance for surgery, uh, sorry, for injections that can help you be accurate. And, you know, whether you're dealing with a frozen shoulder, which is a capsule problem, or a bicep tendonitis, which is a bicep tendon problem, or a rotator cuff tear, which is obviously a rotator cuff problem, I think it's important to make sure whatever injection treatment you're doing gets in the right place. So we use uh, ultrasound guidance in the office as a, as a way to do that. And then, you know, the last thing is, you know, now we have a lot of technology and arthroscopic techniques that help us do surgery when necessary uh, in a way that doesn't involve opening up the joint. It can be done using uh, a camera and some um, holes uh, to put tools into the shoulder. So it's a lot less invasive than traditional techniques. So uh, that's uh, you know a huge advantage for us now in surgical treatment being much less invasive. So um, the, the goals for today were to just go over some um, basics of shoulder pain and some different causes. Um, in the next five to 10 minutes, I wanna go over a couple of what I, what I call the top five myths uh, regarding shoulder pain. And um, these are things I hear in the Central Valley. So these are things I've heard from patients, I've heard them from uh, primary care doctors, and I want to debunk some of these myths. And then we'll talk a little about shoulder arthritis, um, not not in great detail, but enough that we understand what a shoulder replacement is, because a lot of people have never heard of that. Um, a big part of our program at St. Joe's focuses on, on total shoulder replacement surgery and getting really good outcomes from that operation, which is um, you know something that we think we, we do 
uh, quite well now. So uh, let's go through this really quickly. Um, I'll take about five minutes to go through some slides, and then we'll open it up for questions at about 6:20. So, um, you know, this is this is a case presentation. I, I think it's it's helpful to use case cases to understand um, problems. So this is a 57-year-old gentleman with um, a long-standing history of shoulder pain who has, um, you know, all the features of cartilage wear and bone spurs of arthritis. And so let's go through that really quickly. So typically the patient like this is going to tell you their shoulder clicks and catches, doesn't have very good uh, range of motion. And if you look at the x-rays, they've got um, bone spurs. That's uh, the circle down there. They've got narrowing of the joint space and they've got all the hallmark findings of arthritis. And so when you're talking about arthritis, um, you're talking about a wearing out or a loss of that smooth cartilage that normally sits on top of the ball of the shoulder. And when that when that cartilage wears out, you eventually will get to a bone on bone situation. And that's that's when you got uh, end stage uh, or the late stage arthritis and no longer are conservative management uh, gonna help you. So you get a, a view here of what a normal shoulder looks like versus a, a arthritic shoulder. You can see how different those things look. So in that situation, again, always your history and your clinical exam, your x-rays will help you make the diagnosis and an MRI scan is gonna be really useful to look at the rotator cuff. So we talked about some of the pain symptoms, uh, the x-ray findings and an MRI scan in this condition is not necessary, but it does help you uh, better understand the rotator cuff condition. And so, you know, at the top of that slide, you see all the traditional non-surgical, we call it conservative management options, your anti-inflammatories, your cortisone injections, physical therapy. Um, but when that doesn't, doesn't work, um, if you're at this stage of arthritis, you're talking about a total shoulder replacement. So let's go through that very quickly. So um, first myth is shoulder arthritis only happens to old people and your only option is a joint replacement. So that, that's not true for two reasons. One is that shoulder arthritis oftentimes starts in a patient in their 40s. And if you get an early diagnosis, you have the option of doing some of these non-surgical or minimally invasive things. Um, unfortunately, if you get to the diagnosis later on, 50s and 60s, the shoulder joint's much more worn out and there's very little to work with. Then you're talking about surgery uh, to replace the joint. So um, early diagnosis is always very helpful. It gives you more options typically. Um, the other myth I want to debunk here is that shoulder replacements don't work well. Um, that was probably true about 30, 30 years ago. But you know, in the, in the last 30 years, and particularly since 2003, with the, approve, uh, with the approval of some more new FDA designs, Shoulder replacement technology has really progressed significantly in the last 15 years. And um, it's really one of the most successful procedures now in orthopedics. It's the third most uh, replaced joint behind the hip and the knee. So, uh, you know, a lot of us know people have gotten a hip or knee replacement, but shoulder replacements are right, right, right up next to it. So this is kind of what a shoulder replacement looks like. Uh, it's basically, in summary, it's a metallic ball um, against a, a polyethylene or a uh, kind of a plastic socket that forms your new joint and it's anchored to a stem. And, and this, this is all done through um, a surgical approach here. And a typical shoulder replacement now should be able to last you 15, 20 years, if not longer, and give you a good outcome. Um, we went over this here. Um, I will emphasize the careful technique to preserve the rotator cuff is really important in a shoulder replacement because um, even though the rotator cuff may not be perfectly functional, the more you're able to preserve, the better outcome you're gonna get. And, now, we are able to use computer navigation now. We call it GPS navigation. It really helps us plan out the way we cut the bone in a specific angle with high accuracy to really preserve as much rotator cuff as we can. So um, that's something we've been doing since November of 2017 in St. Joe's. Um, it's, we were one of the first centers to do GPS or computer-guided shoulder replacement. And I think it's made a huge outcome. Um, you know, We're now over 200 cases with GPS, and it's been a real game changer for us. So. That's our patient. Our first patient underwent a uh, shoulder replacement surgery, um, had an overnight stay in the hospital, went home uh, uneventfully. Uh, there's this post-operative x-ray. You can see the new um, ball and socket and, um, you know, off pain meds by two weeks, um, two months of physical therapy to regain range of motion. And um, this patient actually has gone back to being a football coach. So a very high level of function uh, with this replacement with very little difficulty. So that was, um, you know, a typical shoulder replacement case. Now, um, I'm going to briefly touch into a different kind of shoulder replacement. Um, this is a, a, a different case, a 62-year-old gentleman with a lot of um, instability and dislocations. And um, to, cut, to make a long story short, um, he's got some um, features of arthritis on the x-ray, but if you look at his MRI scan, 
um, you know, his MRI scans show the totally non-functional rotator cuff. So that's a totally different situation where you've got arthritis, but you also have a bad rotator cuff. Um, in this situation, you're going to have, you know, uh, what we call a non-repairable rotator cuff. It's not that we don't want to do it. We're not lazy. It's just it's not going to be able to heal. So in that situation, you're going to have MRI findings that confirm that. Um, we refer this we refer to this as, as rotator cuff tear arthritis or arthropathy. It's a little different flavor. Um, and you really, really have severe functional loss in this case. Um, in that situation, non-operative treatment is not going to give you much function. Unfortunately, um, this was something that was unsolvable until um, we had new technology for this. Um, and previously, the myth was, you know, if you have a history of rotator cuff tears and failed surgeries, then you're out of options. And that, that's not the case. There, there is something now called the reverse shoulder replacement. It is the most common type of replacement that I do now in my practice, not a standard replacement. So it's become a very, very reliable option in people with arthritis and rotator cuff uh, problems at the same time. It's a very good option. So what this does is really reverses the mechanics of the shoulder. Um, you got a ball of the shoulder here and a socket now uh, oriented opposite. And um, the ball goes on the socket, if you can see that right there. And the socket is now anchored to this stem. And what this does is create some to more stability that doesn't rely on the rotator cuff to work. So um, that's the reverse shoulder replacement. You know, uh, without getting into the biomechanics, it really helps to reverse the forces here and gives you function without a rotator cuff. It's very exciting. Um, it's you know typically an older patient, you know, 60 or older. Um, the rehabilitation is is quite quite rapid because it doesn't rely on healing, and you can get a really impressive uh, restoration of your uh, range of motion here. Um, now, keep in mind the drawbacks is we don't know how long these things last. It's only been around since 2003. It's still relatively new. And um, there's fewer options to revise it uh, if it wears out. But, you know, our, our data has been really encouraging. Uh, we now have 17-year data on it from the early uh, adoption in uh, the United States, and it's been a very uh, durable prosthesis. So this is what it looks like in our patient. Um, again, overnight stay, you got discharged the next day. Um, off narcotics by one month, uh, another eight weeks worth of rehab. And this is his two months function. So this is this is someone that couldn't move their arm that now can uh, raise it uh, pain free. So um, that's a typical reverse uh, replacement. Um, now keep in mind, um, I want to put a little plug in for St. Joe's. Our, our program started in 2014 with our goal of becoming a center of excellence. And you know now in 2020, we're among the top 10% of shoulder placement volume hospitals in the country. So. You know, it's been a, a really great program development that we've had here. Um, the hospital has invested in some great equipment, and you know, we think we're doing uh, some real state-of-the-art stuff here. And, you know, number myth number four, uh, before we wrap up here, um, a shoulder replacement is just like a hip or a knee. Um, I'll say one thing is that these things are very, very sensitive to, um, to, to accurate placement, you know, even more so than other joints. And so we call this a game of millimeters, not a game of inches. And so... Uh, as I mentioned, uh, three years ago, we started doing GPS computer guided uh, surgery. Um, our accuracy has gone up as a result of this and it's become um, a really um, useful tool to help us get it right every time. So um, last minute and then we'll open up to questions. Shoulder replacements hurt. You know, my typical shoulder replacement patient will tell me they had less pain than my rotator cuff patients. And um, part of that is because we've developed pain protocols and nerve blocks and really a lot of great things uh, to control and prevent pain at every step. So um, since COVID-19, 90% of patients now who are getting shoulder replacements are doing same day discharge, meaning they're not even staying in the hospital at all. And um, we've had very few pain issues. So, um, you know, this has been a real game changer as well. So with that, um, let me wrap it up. Um, we talked about some different diagnoses um, and then we got into some more detail on shoulder arthritis. Um, you know, obviously it has very specific findings and, um, it, it's got a reliable uh, procedure now with shoulder replacements and reverse shoulder replacements, depending on the specific uh, situation that you're in. So it looks like we're at 625. I promise to wrap it up in 25 minutes. Um, I want to acknowledge the St. Joe's team. And then um, I'd like to open up for questions if that's okay. Dr. Iyengar, I have quite a few questions that were submitted in advance. Can I start asking them now? Absolutely. Fire away. So one question says that, are there any simple exercises that could be done on a daily basis for shoulder maintenance and shoulder health? Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, there's probably two sets of exercises. One are um, simple um, pendulum exercises, just for range of motion. And 
it's a simple thing you can you can google it or i'm happy to send it out um to the group after the, the talk is over um pendulum exercises are just a way of getting the shoulder moving and um that's something you can do at home now the other set of exercises that's really useful are exercises using a resistance band to work on the rotator cuff and um a simple uh, resistance band that you can get you know in a even in a drugstore can be helpful and you can use that to go through a range of motion against some band resistance and that helps to develop the rotator cuff muscles and again these things um i'd be happy to send these out to the group that, that they can be done at home not necessarily with, with a with a uh, physical therapist so i hope that answers the question yeah thank you um, another question is when doing something good, like exercising, like swimming, can it damage the shoulder over time, that repetitive motion? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, it's near and dear to my heart. I'm actually a swimmer myself. So um, swimming does cause a lot of stress on the rotator cuff. And there is something called swimmer's bursitis, which is basically um, inflammation of the rotator cuff caused by that repetitive motion. So um, if you're if you're engaging in swimming, number one, you do want to be on some sort of maintenance rotator cuff program like the one i just discussed and number two if you get shoulder pain you know go see a specialist i'm you know i'm happy to see you and oftentimes a cortisone injection can be helpful for swimmer's bursitis so it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean you have a rotator cuff tear but you know careful you know maintenance therapy and maintenance injections can be a big part of that okay um somebody asked about stem cell treatments Yes, very, very hot topic right now. Um, so right now, you know, the current state of FDA approval for, this, for stem cell treatments is really kind of in flux. And what, what I mean by in flux is that um, there's still a lot of, uh, of FDA approval issues as to what constitutes um, an appropriate use and delivery of stem cells. Um, that's a big topic by itself. But um, the reason I bring it up is that I actually don't do stem cells in my practice for that reason, because there's still some uh, debate over the FDA approval. Now, the one thing that I think is most exciting on the, um, the biologic front right now is PRP. And we talked about that briefly during the talk. PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Um, what it does is if you isolate and concentrate platelets that are then injected back into the shoulder and platelets actually carry a tremendous amount of, of uh, growth and healing factors. So it's not stem cells, but it has some of the same principles applied to it. Um, and PRP injections can be very useful for things like rotator cuff tendonitis, um, biceps and labral issues, um, soft tissue pathology, and things um, where you're trying to promote healing. So um, if, you're, if you're looking for something that's on the PRP or stem cell spectrum, um, I, I would highly encourage you to talk to somebody like about PRP. Um, as I mentioned, I had a PRP injection in my shoulder and you know, I think it helped uh, quite a bit. And so um, that's something to discuss. And, uh, that's not quite stem cells, but along the same line. Okay, and somebody said their shoulder pain started in their wrist, uh, the pain started in their wrist and progressed to the shoulder. Is that something they should be worried about? They have high blood pressure. So that's an, that's an interesting point. Obviously, it's, it's a little bit hard to speculate um, not having examined um, that situation, but I will say this. Um, oftentimes, when you have a situation where there's wrist or hand involvement or even forearm involvement along with the shoulder, it may not be directly related to a shoulder condition. It may be related to a nerve condition. So we see this very commonly. Um, in my practice, I see patients referred to me for arm pain in the shoulder, elbow, and wrist. And it turns out that it was actually maybe a pinched nerve up in the neck. And so um, that gets back to careful diagnosis. Um, you know, nerves are interesting. Nerves can be pinched in one place up in the neck, and you can have pain lower down in the arm unrelated to the neck and it's hard to believe that one causing the other but that's just the way nerves work and you know sometimes with, with nerve conduction tests you can actually pinpoint that a little better so um, that, that's one place where you gotta, gotta think about maybe nerve not shoulder pain. Okay um, somebody asked what holds the ball and socket in traditional or reverse procedural replacement what holds it? That's a great question so in a in a standard or traditional uh, shoulder replacement What's holding the shoulder together is what normally holds the shoulder together, which is combination of the shoulder capsule, uh, the shoulder ligaments, um, the rotator cuff, which is preserved in a standard replacement, and um, the other big muscles that uh, confer stability, the deltoid, and um, you know some of the other muscles of the chest wall. So that's the standard replacement. Now, in the reverse replacement, we know that the rotator cuff is typically um, not functional or, or poorly functional in some ways. And so in that situation, 
uh, there usually is some rotator cuff that's still preserved, but most of the work is being done by the deltoid muscle. So a reverse shoulder placement is really um, relying on the deltoid muscle tension and the deltoid obviously being the biggest muscle in the shoulder that, um, that provides that stability. Okay. You said they're recovering after the effects of a frozen shoulder and wanted to know what recommendations you might have. So that's a really good question um, and a really complicated topic, but I'll try to cover it in 30 seconds. Um, so a frozen shoulder, like, like I said, involves some formation of scar tissue in the capsule. Um, so the, the treatment or the recovery consists of number one, usually decreasing inflammation. So oftentimes I'll start with something like either um, non-steroidal medications or even steroid, uh, steroid taper packs. So we'll start with reducing inflammation and pain. Step two is a cortisone injection delivered into the capsule of the shoulder. Um, it has to get done usually um, in my practice done under ultrasound guidance to make sure you're injecting the proper place to help to deliver cortisone into the joint, but help stretch that capsule out as well to get things moving. And the third thing is physical therapy is once you get some pain relief and um, anti-inflammatory effect, then physical therapists can take over and stretch it out over time. Now, the one important part of this, I mentioned this briefly earlier, um, this is oftentimes associated with diabetes or prediabetes. And so whatever you're doing for the shoulder also has to address the underlying uh, pathology of diabetes. So you have to get your, your sugars under control as well to get a meaningful result. So um, I just had to throw that in there because you, know, you have to make sure you're addressing both things at once. Okay, and somebody says that they have shoulder pain mostly in the morning when they wake up. Is it their sleeping position? Is it their pillow? Is it their bed? Yeah, great point. Um, so a little bit of orthopedic trivia. So the rotator cuff is actually the only muscle that is on full stretch when you sleep. Um, no other muscle has that feature that is, that is fully stretched in, in a position of sleep. So night pain or morning pain with rotator cuff problems is very common. Now, um, waking up with a sore shoulder, um, that oftentimes is associated with the diagnosis of shoulder bursitis but it can also be a rotator cuff tear. So that's a situation where an MRI is gonna be very helpful to try, try to figure out, are you dealing with inflammation or are you dealing with some more um, you know, structural type tear? So I, I encourage you to get that evaluated to figure out what, what, um, what camp you're in and you know, uh, come up with your treatment accordingly. Bursitis is usually non-operative, non-surgical, whereas a rotator cuff tear oftentimes requires an operation. Okay. Um, the procedures that you talked about, um, they, are they done at Stockton Ambulatory Surgery Center? And what type of procedures can you do in that center? Great question. So for minimally invasive or arthroscopic surgery, most of those procedures are going to be done in our Stockton Ambulatory Center, uh, which is a joint venture between our practice as well as St. Joseph's Hospital. Um, and so that's going to be most of your arthroscopic or scope surgeries are, are going to be done in the ambulatory center. Now, in some cases, if a patient has some medical issues or we're worried about their heart or lung function after surgery, then we will um, actually do those um, scope cases in the hospital for medical reasons. But that's um, the exception, not the rule. Typically, that's going to be outpatient. Now, on the other hand, shoulder replacement surgeries are typically going to be done in the hospital in most cases. Um, although, as of this year, we've actually started doing these in the ambulatory center as well for very selected patients who are medically quite healthy and fit. So um, now you may see a shoulder replacement actually done in an outpatient center. But um, historically speaking, for the most part, for shoulder scopes and shoulder um, minimally invasive, you're talking ambulatory surgery center. And then for uh, more invasive shoulder placements, you're talking about uh, in the hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody said that they have shoulder pain when they're riding their bike. So they've raised the handlebars um, to help take some of the pressure off. Is, is that something that's recommended? So that depends. Um, again, I'm, I'm always going to hedge a little bit, but the, the typical story there is it sounds like it may be related to impingement. Impingement is kind of a painful rubbing of the rotator cuff on the undersurface of the shoulder blade or the acromion. Now, um, if that's the case, and if it is a true impingement, now, you know, raising the handlebars may, uh, may, um, alleviate some of that pressure, but keep in mind, it's still gonna put a lot of stress on the rotator cuff. So um, that may be a good temporary solution. And if it works, you know, go with it, no problem with it. But uh, keep in mind, if you're getting progressive symptoms where you're having to manipulate your arm more and more in order to avoid that pain, you may wanna get that checked out and figure out if there's a, a true impingement going on. 
Okay. And then there was a question that says, um, if someone's diabetic or have thyroid diso disorders, um, does that present some additional risks for arthroscopy? So that's an amazing question. That's been kind of my um, focus, a lot of my research in the last few years. So yes, and thank you for whoever asked that. Maybe it was planted. Um, so the answer is yes. So diabetes and thyroid disease are the two number one risk factors for adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. So if you have either of these conditions, number one, you gotta make sure that what you're dealing with is um, not a frozen shoulder rather than something else, because that's gonna be a common diagnosis. Now, if you do end up having something else in your shoulder that needs surgery, and you are a diabetic or you have thyroid issues, you're gonna have to be very careful about monitoring for frozen shoulder after surgery. And that's something the surgeon needs to, needs to discuss with you and, and kind of be all over. Also, you got to make sure that whatever your diabetes or thyroid issue is also addressed at the same time as your shoulder recovery, because you're not going to win one without winning the other. So um, in, in that situation, it's really important to get your primary care on board um, and, and have the discussion three ways to make sure that that diabetes or thyroid issue is co-managed along with your shoulder recovery. And, you know, I'm obviously happy to do that along with any primary care physician um, to make sure you get a good result. Thank you. Those are the all the questions that I had that were both on the chat and in advance. I don't know if anybody else on has any additional questions. I'm not seeing any further on the chat, Dr. Iyengar. Okay, very good. So it's 6.40, so we're on time, which is- Oh, fantastic. there's a new message. Okay. And it was Don Wiley saying you did a great job. <laughs> and you did. Thank you so much. It's been very interesting. My pleasure. Thank you all for, uh, for being here and taking the time doing another Zoom call. And um, again, if there's any questions, you know, I'll, I'll try to make my email address available. I'm happy to field more questions over email. Um, and if you ever need to, to see somebody, we're happy to see you here at Alpine Orthopedics. Thank you, Dr. Iyengar. My pleasure. Thank you all.